Today we come with the next installment, Top 10 Reasons That I'm Not Roman Catholic. If you saw yesterday's video, it was Top 10 Reasons That I'm Not a Protestant. And we want to continue that great tradition of the top 10s, that, that great trend of 2015 that <laughs> I'm bringing back, doing top 10 videos, wearing my ugliest possible blazer, ready to go to war, in my blazer, my, my, blazer, my war blazer. Top 10 reasons to not be Roman Catholic. I spent many years in Roman Catholicism in my 20s. Uh, as I said, I explained many times that uh, when it was 2003, when I bought the Church Fathers set you see here by Philip Schaff. Every time I mention this, somebody says it. S-C-H-A-F-F. -F. It's the Anglican Church Fathers set. It's the same set that's at New Advent. I don't know if it's out of print or what. I don't know. I've had mine since 2003. Anyway, when I got that set at the time, I was leaving Protestantism and I didn't know much about orthodoxy. I thought that the whole of the debate was a Protestant Catholic debate. There were not a lot of resources online at that time when it came to orthodoxy, 2003, 2004. So it wasn't really in my mind. I think I had the Timothy Ware book, Orthodox Church, right? That was about it. So I launched into reading Augustine. I started with Confessions, City of God. And then I branched out into his anti-Pelagian, anti-Donatist theological writings, expositions of the Psalms, all these other writings of Augustine. And I was very impressed. And I thought, well, I guess that's the way to go because my assumption at that time was that the Roman Catholic Church has to be the, the, install, the, the, the continuation of the Church of the First Millennium. And my assumption was that when I went into the world of Catholicism, I would find that patristic church. I would find continuity with that first millennium of Christianity. And my assumption still was that because as a, as a Calvinist, we held Augustine in high regard. My assumption was, well, he's got to be, you know, the, the, the guy to go to. And if he's a Latin father, then I should give preeminence to the Latin church fathers. So I didn't really think much about the Eastern church fathers, right? I thought... Well, Augustine had it all figured out, and then the Eastern Fathers didn't really figure much out. I'm sure they had good guys. I just didn't see the, the importance of those guys at that time. So that sent me into the world of Thomas Aquinas. So here you see the Summa Contra Gentiles, the Catina Aurea, uh, the Summa itself, and other Thomas works, as well as the rest of this whole shelf here being Thomas and Roman Catholic dogma and so forth. So I went into that world and... and it took a few years before I was introduced to traditional Catholicism. In the world of traditional Catholicism that we've talked about many times, be it the Society of St. Pius X, be it the Diocesan Latin Mass, the FSSP, be it the Set of Acontis, this world was a whole new world, and I was immediately involved in uh, all new controversies. You, you leave the world of Calvinism and its theological debates, its little minutiae, tiny little world, and then you step into this bigger world, and then you find a, a new world of controversies and minutia <clears throat> and so at the time again I, I didn't really have a lot of the nuances of Vatican II and all that in my mind yet but after a few years I launched into that so I began to read books on Vatican II and eventually I read Vatican II itself and then I picked up a copy of as you've seen me point out many times Heinrich Denzinger who, by the way, is uh, an editor. He's not the author of this book. This is a book that just simply lists the sources of Catholic dogma. So I started to read Catholic dogma, and I became convinced that the traditional Catholics were more faithful to Trent, right? If you see here is the, count, the Catechism of the Council of Trent. So I got that, and I read that, and I got my Ludwig Ott. This is 2005, six, long time ago. I launched into this world and I, and I tried to solve the, the mysteries and the problems of Roman Catholicism. And the first things that came to the fore were obviously the, the, the disjunction between the pre-Vatican II papal writings and encyclicals and the Vatican II documents themselves and the post-Vatican II writers and popes and encyclicals. So this is a, uh, an immense field. It's a lot of uh, theology, a lot of writing, a lot of authors, a lot of people, Jesuits, Thomists, jurists, 
canon lawyers. It's, it's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into the question of is Vatican II a break with the Tridentine era of Catholicism or is it somehow meshable? Can we somehow put these two systems together? And at the time, it was just a question of that, that validity of, the, of these two uh, you know, post-1965 developments and pre-1965 dogmas. But eventually I started asking deeper questions about, well, maybe there are problems that go back further because you start to realize the deeper you get into the history of Catholic theology, the Catholic theology didn't just explode in the 20th century into these different schools. Catholic theology had predecessors to what happened at Vatican II. For example, the liturgical movement, right? We mentioned this before, the liturgical movement, the, the liturgical reforms of Pius X, Pius XII, those actually anticipated what happened at Vatican II. <laughs> and as a trout, I didn't really understand this. I just thought, well, uh, after Pius XII, it's all a bunch of liberals, right? Um, but to this is just to give you some context as to, to what you know led me down this route and why I came to eventually reject Roman Catholicism. Uh, and it centers primarily around the doctrine of the church, the papacy, and Vatican I. Those are the central reasons to reject Roman Catholicism. So let's start with the first one, which is the papacy. <laughs> if the dogma of papal infallibility is the foundation stone of the church, uh, that is what Vatican I says. Pastor Eternus is very clear. We've done many videos. We've, we've outlined this many, many times. I'm not going to rehash all that. I will put below a couple articles in the comments. I'll link two articles in the comments where I've covered this in detail. If you want to read uh, the actual citations, it would take forever if I just sat here and read all the citations. So um, we know the elements that are laid out in Vatican I as to what makes the church one, what makes it visible, what makes it unified, what makes it have its uh, force and power in the world, and that's the office of Peter, the See of Peter. Uh, the See of Peter cannot ultimately be divorced from Rome. Uh, it always has that connection, even during the Avignon Papacy. It still can't be divorced from Rome. Uh, and that's made, again, very clear at Vatican I in canon law and many of the documents that we've covered recently. So the question then is that if this is the one true church, then there ought to be a continuity. There ought to be a consistency. And most Roman Catholic apologists will admit, uh, as Ibarra did in the debate, if you, if you can find a dogmatic contradiction, then you've disproven the whole Roman system and the whole papacy because it's all built on this house of cards, you see. So the first doubt and the first question that came into my mind is, uh, again, why, if this is the foundation stone of the actual praxis of the church, wouldn't it be the first uh, dogma that is, that is uh, uh, defended and defined at the ecumenical councils? Wouldn't Nicaea or perhaps an earlier council like Gangra have dealt with this dogma itself? Why is this the last extraordinary dogma? Right. Well, last in the sense of the last ecumenical council right? for the Roman Catholics, that is. Uh, and then that, I think, leads to the issues that I raised in the top five reasons uh, that top five easy ways to refute the, pa the papacy. Uh, and the second of those top five reasons, you'll have that link below. You can read all this. This is not my, my second reason not to be a Roman Catholic. This is just the, the top five reasons that are easily uh, uh, demonstrable proofs that the Roman Catholic Church has changed its position dogmatically. And one of those examples I gave in that article was the death penalty, how this was formerly seen uh, for many, many centuries in the Roman Catholic Church as an aspect of natural law. Natural law obviously can't change. And yet now this is seen to be something that is uh, accidental and, and changeable in relationship to to natural law. And so even the trads themselves in the Roman Catholic world are hotly debating, oh, Francis didn't really mean this. He didn't really mean that you don't have to, even though the catechism, which is part of the normative ordinary teaching of the church, has been, it gets updated to reflect these uh, changes and these updates. Uh, they still wrangle and cope and engage in the mental gymnastics to try to, say, to try to say, oh, but it's not really changed because the Pope can't actually go against tradition. Actually, the Pope defines and interprets tradition. Vatican I is very clear about that. Canon law is very clear about that. You have to follow the not just the extraordinary teaching, but also the universal ordinary teaching of the papacy. That's made very clear in Vatican I. And in fact, it's a condemned proposition, and we showed, as we showed in our last article, that you only have to follow the extraordinary uh, infallible teachings and not the universal ordinary teachings. That's actually a condemned proposition. 
So um, the next point I would say that is problematic for just the papacy itself, uh, as I listed in my article, is that it is a power that grew to include temporal dominion. This is brought to the forefront of Metropolitan Seraphim and Piraeus' uh, excellent essay letter that's about 80 or 90 pages that he wrote to Francis, the Orthodox bishop who wrote to Francis um, when Francis was elected. And this is the idea that uh, no longer was it a, a, a spiritual power, but by the time of, say, uh, Unum Sanctum, you have this idea that the Pope is actually over every uh, 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 temporal authority as well and he has the right to depose and pronounce you know basically in the civil sphere anything he wants and that in order to be saved every human creature must be subject to the roman pontiff not just spiritually but also in a temporal sense and uh, this of course corresponds to the third temptation or to the temptation the three temptations of christ right one of those being the to be given dominion over the entire world uh, and St. Justin Popovich has a great critique of this in his in his book, Orthodox Faith and Life in Christ, where he, he compares this to uh, the temptation of Satan. Uh, Grand Inquisitor chapter of Dostoevsky compares it to the temptation. Uh, and along with that, what, what has historically helped to prop up the temporal authority of the Roman See uh, and it's basically God emperor status in the civil sphere as well as the spiritual realm were a bunch of forgeries. The donation of Constantine, uh, the pseudo Ambrose writings, the Samachian forgeries, the pseudo Isidorian decretals, the Gratian decretals, uh, texts like the errors of the Greeks that Aquinas relied on, which are all now admitted and known forgeries. Even the Vatican itself admits that all these documents are essentially later forgeries. Well, for centuries, those were used to prop up uh, the, the authority of the Pope in the temporal sphere, among other things, right? Dictatus Pape is another one of these great uh, ridiculous documents, which are no longer appealed to by the Vatican itself, hence the uh, scandal and double think of the uh, Roman Catholic traditionalist world, right? Trying to reconcile these centuries, these millennia of these, the last millennia of claims of just extensive, uh, insane levels of power that have now been discarded uh, under the cloak of humility on the part of the Vatican to popes. Um, the next point I would say under the papacy is that the modern papacy uh, is essentially a problem in comparison to the operation of the papacy prior to Vatican II, right? So those are all number one. This is point number one, and then I'm listing the papacy itself as a problem. So just, just go to that article if you want a, a fuller version of this, but I want to give other reasons why I'm not a Roman Catholic other than just kind of rehashing the arguments about the papacy, which again, you can find in that article. And the next point, I'm going to plug my computer in or it's going to die. The next point is um, that the supposed purpose for the papacy, which is to give us certitude and, and certainty on dogma. The last hundred years of Roman Catholicism has proven that that doesn't actually work. Uh, and in fact, it is demonstrably the case that it does not solve the dilemma that it's supposed to solve. We know from Vatican I the way it lays out a certain anthropology and a certain epistemology that could be classed as classical foundationalism, that essentially the way that you know the true church, according to Vatican I, is that you just simply look at the history you tally up the facts and you look and see which institution has existed for 2000 years and has been infallible and inerrant, right? It literally says that this is, you just kind of look at history and you, you tally up these facts and you check these boxes and that's how you'll know that the Roman Catholic church is the true church. That's the epistemology, epistemology, uh, based on, on, um, uh, um, the acceptance of the philosophy and epistemology and anthropology of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, right, which is, again, classical foundationalism, that's how you know. And then when we come to the question of how do we know what the dogmas of Roman Catholicism are, the answer is that well, you follow the Pope, and you follow the Pope when he's teaching authoritatively in extraordinary or universal ordinary magisterium. And you also have to follow the normative, not universal ordinary magisterium, ordinary magisterium as well. Right. So all three of these layers of Roman Catholic dogma have to be followed despite the fact of these sort of descending levels of authority that they possess. But then the question, though, is that how do I know that I'm interpreting these documents 
because I, it still has to get to me as the individual Catholic, right? It still has to get into my head. And so when we ask a question about certitude and we say that instead of it just being like the Protestants, you read those books and interpret those books, then we just add on the, the so let's say we got the Bible here as a Protestant and the Roman Catholic says, ah, but you need the Pope to help you interpret the Bible. Then we stack that on, right? Well, now we've got just a bunch of more documents and writings and teachings and encyclicals and councils, right? Now we just added this book here of all the ecumenical councils, right, of the Roman Catholic system. Well, that still doesn't solve the, the problem that we've asked, which is an epistemic problem, an epistemic question of how we know with certitude that we're interpreting these documents rightly. Because remember, the original problem was that Protestants can't interpret the Bible correctly. They need the Pope. Well, how do I know that I'm interpreting the Pope correctly? It's a, it's a moving the problem back a step, and it's not actually answering the epistemic question, the epistemological certitude question, by just moving it back a step. And so it's circular. Now, Ultimately, there is an element of circularity to paradigm level questions, right? We believe that as presuppositionalists, if we if you follow through the transcendental argument or presuppositional reasoning, then you would know that, yeah, ultimately these questions are uh, presuppositional or transcendental in nature. And so they can't be resolved by just appealing to another empirical fact and trying to interpret that empirical fact. Ultimately, it does resolve and, and rely on the question of the individual being taught by the Holy Spirit. But you'll say, wait a minute, that sounds Protestant. But where we disagree with the Protestant is not the individual enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, because even a Roman Catholic could admit that. Where we disagree with both of these groups is the means that the Holy Spirit uses to enlighten us and teach us, right? So we would say that the, the papacy doesn't actually solve this question. And when we look at the actual teachings of the papacy, we can actually demonstrate very easily that it has contradicted itself, especially after Vatican II, especially with Pachamama, especially with the ordinary magisterium. <laughs> so the Roman Catholic epistemology is, uh, doesn't achieve what it's supposed to achieve. It moves the problem back a step. And once you realize that, it kind of loses all of its force. The second point, uh, the third point would be that the, the modus operandi of the church for the first millennium is synodal. You have canons that talk about bishops being uh, anointed in the presence of other bishops in a met metropolitan. Nothing to do, nothing mentioned about the Pope affirming all bishops in the world. However, after the schism, that's how all bishops in the world in the Roman Catholic system come to be bishops. They have to be approved by the Pope himself directly. There's nothing about these uh, college of cardinals that elect a singular monarch to rule the entire church. In fact, in the ecumenical councils, you have the 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 uh, the idea of an appellate structure, as we uh, called attention to in the Eric Ibarra debate. But that is a far cry from Vatican I's infallibility. That is a far cry from the Pope being the God Emperor who has uh, authority over all princes and monarchs, right, to depose them at will. Does that happen in the second, third, fourth century? No, it doesn't happen until later on as this doctrine evolves. And so what we'll see is that the, the doctrine of papacy itself actually involve, evolves and Roman Catholics utilize the notion of evolution of dogma, as uh, Cardinal Newman wrote about, to defend this idea. We don't believe that in, in the Orthodox conception. So the first millennium of the church, the, the mindset of those Christians especially at, say, the Sixth Council, was that they had no problem condemning a pope, Pope Honorius. Now, it doesn't matter whether you, I know that Roman Catholics say, well, he wasn't really a heretic. It doesn't matter because the argument that I'm making is that if an ecumenical council accepted as ecumenical had the mindset that they could condemn the Roman See, then the, the dogma of Vatican I was not in anyone's mind in the Sixth Council. And you'll see this mindset actually reaffirmed in modern Vatican writings and theologians, especially if you look at something like Introduction to Christianity by Ratzinger, back when he was writing as a cardinal. Uh, on page 279 of Introduction to Christianity, he actually admits that the uh, lowest level of ex cathedra pronouncements are the ones after Vatican I, and that we can't really speak this way in dialogue with the Orthodox anymore. Uh, as if this is a recent thing and that there's no such thing as dogmatic pronouncements for the virgin birth. That's literally what he says in the footnote here when he's interacting with a extremely liberal theologian. Now, he, Ratzinger is a modernist. He was a liberal theologian for many, many, many decades. Uh, and he's actually interacting with a an extremely uh, liberal Dutch Jesuit theologian that he's supposedly disagreeing with. And he says that... Um, 
In the matter of the virgin birth, this Dutch theologian is looking for an extant uh, dogmatic statement. He says, but in reality, such an assertion turns the history of dogma upside down and attributes ab absoluteness to a mode of exercising the teaching, teaching function only in regular use since Vatican I. This is unacceptable in view of the dialogue with the Orthodox, but, from the, but also from the very nature of the matter itself. And even Schunenberg, this uh, Jesuit theologian himself, does not stick to it through the thick and thin. In fact, dogma as a single tenet proclaimed by the Pope, ex cathedra, is the latest and lowest way of, of forming dogma. The original form in which the church states her faith in binding way is the creed or the symbol in the profession of faith. And then he goes on to say to look for dogmatic statements like this prior to Vatican I is absurd. Well, that's an admission that Vatican I uh, is a innovation, that it's a, an evolution of doctrine and, and praxis for the church. Of course it is. Thank you for that admission. And by the way, he has many other such admissions, such as his admissions in his other writings about the Orthodox Church continuing the modus operandi of the church in the first millennium. They're famous statements, by the way. That's not me making them up. I'm not taking them out of context. Um, so we see a synodal church, uh, and we don't see a, an autocracy in the first millennium. And the, the rise of autocracy grows uh, to new heights after the schism in the first millennium. And the next problem, the next reason I would not be Roman Catholic is the, the contradictions of Vatican II. Vatican II in many, many, many places contradicts uh, prior dogmatic teaching. And I'll go to some of these examples for you, some of the more blatant examples, one of which would be the uh, ecumenical movement itself. If you read Mortalium Animos, the famous encyclical of Pius XI, in the 1920s, it absolutely condemned as apostasy all forms of interfaith gatherings. And that document would actually be classed under universal ordinary magisterium because it was normative for the entire Roman Catholic communion. Vatican II is the complete official papal Roman see acceptance of the most extreme forms of ecumenism all the way up to what we see now with Pachamama. So for example, if you uh, look at the decree on ecumenism, there is a, a very early on in section three, a denial of the unity and communion of the church to now be something that is dispersed amongst many, many, many conflicting groups. So you have an outright denial of what in Denzinger would be called the doctrine of no salvation outside the visible constraints of the Roman Catholic Church. Pope Pelagius II, Pope, Pelagius, Pope Eugenius IV condemn the idea that there are, in fact, martyrs outside of the Roman Catholic communion. Vatican II, in its documents on uh, ecumenism, admits that there are martyrs outside of the Roman communion. So I'll give you those right here. Uh, this is... Denzinger uh, 247, which goes on to state that there are absolutely no martyrs outside of the communion with the papacy. We're not talking about martyrs outside of generic Christianity. Martyrs outside of the communion with the Pope himself. This is restated in Denzinger 714 at the time uh, of Florence where it specifically states that even if you die outside of communion with the Roman bishop, you are not a martyr. So there are no martyrs outside of the communion of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I am very aware of baptism of desire and all these different debates and, and so forth within Roman Catholicism, but my point is that you can clearly see that Vatican II is taking ecumenism uh, and moving it into the point to where there's now actually communion with people who don't have the same faith. This is proven by the fact that the Uniates uh, have always been brought under the umbrella of the papacy, even when they reject Trent, Purgatory, they, they hallow uh, St. Gregor Palamas. I'll include the video from David the Real Medwhite, one of our buddies, below where he actually shows that Uniatism, the Uniate, Byzantine, Eastern Catholics themselves refute the absurdity of Roman Catholicism because you have people allowed under communion who don't have the same faith. They reject purgatory. They reject Trent. They reject uh, uh, created grace, right? They believe in the Eastern Orthodox theology, a, a lot of it, 
And then they turn around and are told that if they accept the papacy, they can be in communion, even though they don't hold to the faith. And thus you see the changing of position on St. Gregory Palamas, right? For ecumenical reasons, he's now a saint, according to John Paul II. So it's just absurd. As we move through uh, Vatican two documents uh, we're told in the decree on ecumenism that prayer could be made in common with people who affirm heresies uh, in in section eight that there is a communio in sacris with heretics again in, in uh, 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 section eight also on page 534 if you have this version that there are now uh schismatics and heretics who are martyrs and who build up the church this is section 15 remember how night and day this is with the two sections of denzinger that we just mentioned and then when we move to the the clearest example if we look at the document um Well, let's look, for example, at the, the Catholic uh, and the relationship with the separated Eastern churches. We are told that sacraments may be given to those in the Eastern churches outside of communion with Rome. Um, so this is actually contrary to Lateran 4, uh, Constitution 3 of Lateran 4 on heretics, which says that no sacraments can be given to those outside the visible communion of the church. It also goes against Gregory the Sixteenth and Pius the Ninth who uh, taught that those who eat the lamb outside the church will perish. Uh, God does not approve of all sects, we are told, in the traditional teachings of the church. But here we're told that God is actually working through all of the sects and all the different schisms according to the Roman Catholic mindset. That's uh, that you can now share communio in sacris, communicatio in sacris, section 29 of the decree of the Eastern Churches, even though the Eastern churches completely reject multiple dogmas of the Roman Catholic church. And the key crowning example of the, the changes in dogma uh, would be the counter syllabus, right? Dignitatis Humanae, the declaration on uh, religious liberty, also uh, the declaration on the other religions, as we'll see. But uh, this one is great because I can give you, if you read Immortal Dei and Mirari Vos, these are two papal encyclicals, they actually necessitate that the state be confessional. States must be Catholic. They must be confessionally Catholic. This is mentioned in the syllabus of errors, which is in Denzinger. Syllabus of errors, num within the syllabus, these are numbers 77, 78, and 55, and almost all the pre-Vatican II uh, popes. In fact, there's even the Feast of Christ the King that was instituted to combat the error of religious liberty. Vatican II dogmatically accepts religious liberty, and that there should not be confessional states anymore. And since Vatican II, all of those Vatican II popes have been de-Catholicizing Catholic states. They actually say we should be secular. Uh, there doesn't need to be a confessional state. And then if you read the decree uh, on religious liberty in section 3, it says the state exceeds its authority uh, if it's... Uh, if it, in other words, the state should not be confessional. If, if it tries to have religious bases, then it's exceeding its authority. But again, this is contrary to Immortal Dei, and it's also contrary to Vehementer Nos. So that's a, uh, those are other encyclicals you, you could read. Um, that are contrary to the decree on religious freedom. It says that religious freedom is necessary for a global society to develop. A global society? Is, is that what we're here to build? A global government? Global society? That's at the end uh, of the document. Uh, and then the most notorious of all, Nostra Aetate, the decree on the non-Christian religions. The decree uh, on the non-Christian religions is completely contrary to Merari Vos, M-I-R-A-R-I-V-O-S. It's completely contrary to Mortalium Animos Number 2. It is completely contrary to Denzinger 139. It is uh, completely contrary to the Council of Vienne and Pope Clement V, which states that it is an insult to the holy name and a disgrace to the Christian and Catholic faith that the followers of Islam in their temples and mosques should meet to adore the infidel Muhammad. That is completely contrary to the fact that the, uh, the decree on uh, non-Christian religions says that they worship the same God as we do. 
So again, you can just go look at uh, Cantate Domino of Eugene the Fourth. You can look at Pope Clement V at the Council of VM, uh, which is the 15th Ecumenical Council in the Roman Catholic system. You can look at Aquo Primum, and all of these point out the uh, errors of saying that all the religions basically have a an, 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 an innate uh, truthfulness to them and that they're all seeking after God. Now, I would say that in terms of uh, Hellenism and natural theology, they're actually being kind of consistent because natural theology does lead to that conclusion. But natural theology is not consistent with the previous doctrines of no salvation outside the church. Denzinger 401, Denzinger 444, these state that the Catholic Church does discriminate against heretics and against uh, schismatics holding public office, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yet we have here a statement at the end of the Declaration Nostra Aetate that the Catholic Church and the mind of Christ does not discriminate against anybody on any basis. Uh, excuse me, it does. We discriminate against the wicked and those who worship Satan or those who worship demons and false religions. In fact, it even says... Uh, that Hindus in Hinduism love God. Well, actually, no. Uh, Hinduism is not a path to God. And it quite literally is obviously leaving open through all this vague language um, a way to interpret this in any way that you want. So the next thing I would point out is the bizarre practices that we see in the world of Roman Catholicism. Uh, Fatima, Medjugorje, the Marian apparitions that these actually oftentimes do take the precedence in people's lives over actually knowing the scriptures, knowing the Ten Commandments, knowing the Bible. I mean, I, I met in a lot of the trad chapels that I was in. I met people who, they didn't even know the Ten Commandments, but they knew more, they knew every little detail of Fatima. Uh, now, I'm not saying that that itself disproves the entire religion, but I'm saying that these are tendencies and bizarre practices, you know, things like stigmata happening only after the schism. Uh, these these uh, instances and manifestations of prelest and many in many cases there are instances of just outright bizarre superstitions that are tolerated and advocated heart worship you know we've covered this uh, with Sneck Orthobro Sneck if you didn't hear the talk that we did on the Jesuits and the whole Jesuitical system of manipulation that is something that we would obviously reject as Orthodox and I think that that itself is also something to be um, it's it's a significant enough to make it into the top 10. I mean, if you read uh, Father uh, uh, Malachi Martin's book on the Jesuits, he himself, a former Jesuit who is dubious, I don't think he's a trustworthy character, uh, but nor are any of the Jesuits. Right? I mean, he comes out of that school uh, of, of deception and, and trickery and psychological warfare. Uh, and so he, he's a perfect exemplar uh, himself admitting that this whole institution is nonsensical as well as undermining it and and being part of the, the problem at Vatican II. Malachi Martin was actually at Vatican II uh, and he was involved with Cardinal Bay uh, as a paritas. And these guys are, are all a problem, you see. So I would say that the, um, again, the manifestations of... Um, bizarre practices, the, the female quote unquote saints who are obviously involved in histrionics, uh, and who liken their, their ecstatic experiences to sexual experiences, which we've shown many cases, uh, with snack, um, uh, ortho bro snack, go listen to that talk. I'll have that in the description as well, where we covered the Jesuits. He covered this extensively from the, the traditions in France. I also did a talk with James Kelly many years ago about heart worship, uh, and the sacred heart superstition, which is Nestorian, right? Splitting up the worship of parts of Christ is specifically condemned at Ephesus as Nestorian. And so all these manifestations that we see, even to the point of stuff that may or may not have been accepted, like flagellants and whipping oneself and all this stuff, these are manifestations of faulty, bogus theology, the mortification of the flesh. St. Gregor Palamas actually castigates Barleum, the representative of Roman Catholicism, for teaching mortification. We don't mortify the flesh. Uh, we believe the flesh will be deified. So we don't think the body is evil. And I think that in Roman Catholicism, you have the tendency to those things. And so these bizarre practices are just manifestations of prelest. The next thing I would say is the Vatican Bank. Uh, the Vatican Bank has a history of centuries of money laundering, scams, trickery. And I don't think anybody can honestly believe that Jesus intended to set Peter up with a giant global bank by which he could be involved in mafia money laundering, right? And 
we know that the global elite, the top families in the world are part and parcel to uh, running the Vatican Bank. This is an easily verifiable fact. Uh, and those evil families uh, are essentially closely knit for centuries with this Vatican Bank institution. And there's nothing like that in the New Testament. There's nothing like that in the first millennium of the church. Giant global banking houses involved in usury. Give me a break. The, the Vatican used to forbid usury. And after the Renaissance uh, Hermeticist period of the Vatican, they actually affirmed uh, uh, the usage of usury. So you can actually blame the Vatican for the rise of usury in the Western world. But the Roman Catholics and the trads don't like to talk about that because in the trad mindset, the problems of the, of the church are uh, post-Vatican II. They don't actually go back to the Renaissance, even though you can demonstrate that these problems go back to the Renaissance in books like Occult Renaissance Church of Rome. So uh, the payment debt legal Talmudic framework that we get in this idea of Anselm and God had to pay God off and this kind of stuff the uh, superabundant merits of the saints, the, the superabundant merit, merits of Christ and Mary, this treasury of merits that then can be like a giant sky bank applied to your account, to your temporal punishments that you, you owe temporal punishments, right? And then you have to pay these off. If you do a devotion at this uh, site, Marian site, the Pope has granted you 50 days of uh, temporal indulgence. This is all nonsense, total nonsense, completely foreign to the uh, first millennium of the church. Now, I'm very aware as a former Roman Catholic of how you try to justify this with, oh, well, in the early church, the bishop can impose a period of penance where you couldn't come to, the, if you committed adultery, you couldn't come to communion for 40 days, a year, whatever. And so if the bishop wanted to, he could relax that temporal uh, punishment. That is a far cry from this nonsense of this being calculated up as to thousands, 10,000 days in purgatory where you're burnt for you know spiritually burnt for a thousand years this is all absurdity and by the way for many centuries as i showed in my article refuting dr taylor marshall who won't debate who is a coward by the way uh, he blocked me because he knows he would lose the debate um, i actually showed from his article where he completely contradicts himself about the idea of inherited original sin after augustine it was normative for many many centuries in the west to have a doctrine of inherited guilt Absolutely. It's mentioned multiple times. In fact, and I even point out in the uh, essay refuting Dr. Marshall, two places where Denzinger explicitly contradicts itself on this very point. So I'll also try to include that uh, below in the comments. So that whole payment debt legal system is just complete nonsense, completely foreign to the, the mindset of all the early fathers. They don't teach this. They don't operate this way. It's a, an, an innovation that evolves over time. And then when we get Anselm with the idea of God paying off God in, the, God in this uh, debt exchange, this leads to the reformers and their uh, penal substitution theory, which leads to, as we said, Arianism or Nestorianism or some anti-Trinitarianism to be consistent. The next point I would make is that the Roman Catholic Church has lost its liturgical heritage. And this is the kind of one of the key signs that the Roman Catholic Church is not the true church in, in, insofar as it has almost globally uh, yes, there are some reverent Latin masses here and there. I understand that. But for the most part, the just uh, aberrations and blasphemies and absurdities, everything from priests bringing the hosts in with drones, priests riding uh, uh, clown cars, uh, circuses in the church, techno mass, using cookies, using pizza, using water, using beer, using Coca-Cola in communion, clown masses, puppet masses, Bergoglio himself, the Pope himself, presided over pu uh, puppet masses. This is absurd. This is clown church. And so this shows, this is a sign to everybody that they have not only lost the faith, they've lost any sense of reverence whatsoever. And these abuses are not specific to some area. They're globally abuses in the Roman Catholic communion because Vatican II is a giant innovation uh, it's a it's a it's a light years leap in innovation way beyond any of the innovations before. So yes, in, in the Orthodox perspective, the Vatican has um, in many instances in the last millennium innovated in a in a big way. But Vatican II is a lightning years leap. And then when you get uh, things like a CC, a CC one, and a CC two, these the giant interreligious prayer gatherings, which are uh, another other instances of apostasy according to Mortalium Animos. 
Now you get Pachamama, which is the next level, the next layer of that. So really, it's just following through uh, in uh, the logic, the dark logic of being more and more consistent with itself in terms of its innovations and apostasy. Ninth, I would say that the, um, and by the way, the Orthodox Church does not lose its reverence. Even, quote, liberal Greek churches in Orthodoxy still have reverent worship. So we still at least preserve, there's no clown masses in Orthodoxy. So we, uh, one of the clear ways that we know that we are the true church is that we still preserve the reverent, holy, beautiful liturgical worship of God. And the Roman Catholic Church has abandoned this. And it's not just abandoned this in certain sections, it's abandoned it from the top down. If you read Octorum Fide, uh, which is a condemnation of the Jansenists, Octorum Fide actually says that it is a condemned proposition to believe that the Holy See, the Roman See, can give bad and defective rights to the church as a whole. So every trad who believes that the Roman See has given these rights to the church, which they have, is also condemned under Octorum Fide. That's in Denzinger. Just go, just go read Octorum Fide. Uh, so there you go. That's a cl another clear instance of contradiction because all the trads will say that the, that the rights are problematic. Most of them. Some of them won't say that, oh, well, we could clean these up and we could have a reverent Novus Ordo Missae or whatever. But strictly speaking, typically most of the trads think that that uh, uh, a, a, a the fish rots from the head down, right? <laughs> the problem is the papacy. Uh, if they're being honest with themselves, right? It's not that the, oh, the papacy can't do what it wants to do. And, oh, uh, Ratzinger is hemmed in by a bunch of liberals and he's surrounded by liberals. He can't get get his policies through. This kind of BS that we hear about, you know, come on, give me a break. He's the Pope. He, if he wanted to, he could excommunicate every liberal out there, but he doesn't do that. Um, and so the ninth point I would say is the theological points that we bring up that we've done countless talks and lectures on. I'll include, uh, I'll include links below for each one of these points if you want to delve deeper into that. But um, the addition of the filioque, uh, everyone admits that this is an addition and a change to the creed. Uh, and we had previous popes uh, who specified that the creed could not be changed. They actually agreed with us, the Orthodox. Uh, they actually signed on to the Orthodox Eighth Synod, right? Agreeing with us that the creed, creed can't be changed. And then after that, successive popes said, oh, well, we reversed that decision now. And we decided that the creed can be changed. We can add the filioque. We can upset the balance uh, of the triad and the monarchia of the father. The father is no longer the sole monarchia of the Godhead. Now the son participates in his specific hypostatic property. And so we get from that error on divine simplicity, absolute simplicity, the modal collapse. We get the errors of created grace, which flow from that. We get the error of the doctrine of no noose and just a mind intellect slash body di uh, uh, dichotomy duality in terms of anthropology and, and their their view of man we get errors on christology where there's a lot of nestorianism in latin western uh theology even even in the roman catholic circles they're nestorian oftentimes without even knowing it uh we get the beatific vision heresy which is originism and which is platonism directly out of originism and platonism uh, all of those things are completely rejected in in uh, the orthodox fathers and if you go back to the uh, ecumenical council, that's the sixth council, specifically the disputation with Pyrrhus, you'll see that St. Maximus bases his Christological arguments uh, on the essence energy distinction. And the council includes do uh, dogmatic statements about the essence energy distinction in Christology. So the Roman Catholic Church no longer teaches those things and has explicitly, in many, ca many cases, denied the essence energy distinction or actually said contradictory things to allow the uniates to come in while they also affirm Things like Trent uh, uh, or Vatican I, where divine simplicity uh, negates and excludes uh, the, the essence energy distinction. The acceptance of Thomism, obviously, as the official philosophy of the church, we could never unite with Thomism. Even, even uh, Gennadius Scolarius uh, uh, in the Orthodox Church uh, says that the main problem with us is that we could not ever accept August, uh, Aquinas' divine simplicity doctrine. And he's one of the most uh, uh, favorable. <laughs> to Aquinas uh, amongst the Eastern uh, theologians. So um, if we read, uh, you know, the debate with the barley mite by St. Gregory Palamas, which I've covered many times, you see very clearly the two uh, triadologies, the two Christologies are, are night and day. They don't match up. They're totally different. That whole book is saying that Roman Catholicism is heretical. So, so much for the ecumenical movements to try to blend Palamas with Aquinas. Um, 
the last point I would say is that uh, the Roman Catholic Church basically is, in our day, a tool of globalism. It's a tool of the international uh, Anglo-American establishment primarily. Uh, this came into being mainly at the time of and after Vatican II, and this is detailed by the traditional Catholic lawyer David Wimhoff himself. David Wimhoff is still a traditional Catholic, and he's written a giant 800-page book with a 1,000-plus footnotes or so uh, uh, documenting the CIA's usage of the Roman Catholic Church for its doctrinal warfare program. Again, he's not a conspiracy theorist. He's a traditional Catholic lawyer, and he's gone into great detail in his book uh, called uh, The American Proposition, John Courtney Murray, Time Life Magazine, right? And The American Proposition, the CIA's doctrinal warfare program using the Catholic Church to turn it into an institution uh, that's that was used for the promotion of Americanism during the Cold War. Uh, and so that, I think, completely puts the big puzzle picture. You can have all the theological debates, that's fine, uh, but this is an important puzzle piece for geopolitics because the Roman Catholic traditionalists will say, oh, it's the Freemasons, and oh, this group, this. But this actually is the missing puzzle piece that, and I spent, I've got, I've got an entire shelf up there of just analyzing Vatican II uh, from every different, from the SSPX, from the set of a contest, from the normie uh, traditionalist approach, Michael Davies, as, you name it, Lefebvre. I've got, I've got all those guys. I've read all their books. Uh, Gomares, Christopher Ferrara, all those guys. And, and, the, and the key here is that they're missing the puzzle piece that David Wimhoff has, the key puzzle piece, which is that the Roman Catholic Church has completely been utilized now as a tool of the CIA particularly at Vatican II and afterwards for uh, its Cold War Americanism project. And for me, that was the final straw in terms of the um, understanding of Vatican II. Because you, if you just think about it in terms of commies and, and, and Freemasons, you, you're missing the biggest puzzle piece of all, which Wim Hof has shown beyond any shadow of a doubt. So um, there are some other runner-up uh, critiques that we could make, like... Um, you know, randomly picking out guys like, oh, we just, we follow Augustine and Aquinas. Like those are, that's our two dudes, right? <laughs> like giant shelves of Aquinas, right? Uh, well, but, but, but no, wait a minute. This is a church that's ecumenical, oikumene, in the truest sense, in the classical sense, meaning the empire, right? The emperor is called the ecumenical councils, not the popes, right? So this is a church that is supposed to be universal. How can a universal church be embodied in one dude? And so what we get in Roman Catholicism ultimately is sola papam, right? The Pope alone. And what does all of Roman Catholic apologetics ultimately end up being? Papal lawyerism, defending the Pope and defending the office of the papacy. That's the whole thing. Look at Eric Ibarra. He doesn't know anything about Christology. You can't, he's not going to debate anything to do with any of that, which is what the first millennium of all the church fathers debated. Why didn't they all just appeal to the Pope? Why are they actually debating theology? But as uh, I think it was Dollinger said at the time of Vatican I, and now for after Vatican I, the entirety of Roman Catholic apologetics will be nothing but papal lawyering and papal defense. And that's what you see in the world of Roman Catholic apologetics because the Roman Catholic system fails. Vatican II has made that evident to the entire world, uh, and it's not the true church. So I hope you enjoy this video. Again, all the resources are listed below if you want to see the documentation for all the stuff that I mentioned, the, the various books. I'll mention a few books here if you want to get deeper into this. One of those is uh, my friend, Father Peter Hears. He wrote a great book called The Ecclesiast Ecclesiological Renovation of Vatican II, which looks at uh, Vatican II from an Orthodox perspective. And so he did a lot of uh, graduate work in this field, studied a lot of Vatican II, compared it to um, the patristic tradition. So I would recommend his book is really good on this. Uh, another good book. I don't recommend everything from Dr. Philip Sherrard, but this book is a good introduction to the issue of the uh, church papacy schism topic, and particularly for the latter couple chapters where he shows that divine simplicity, the philosophy of divine simplicity and Hellenism actually conditions the doctrine of the papacy. And so he's very insightful in that regard. In terms of uh, theology, I'm going to recommend a book that you probably wouldn't expect, but it's called The Deification of Man by Georgios Mansaridis. And this is a great book that actually contrasts the theology of St. Gregory Palamas to other traditions, and it does it in a, in a 120 pages. So you could go and read, if you want to, the debate between the Barleyamite and the Roman Catholic uh, by Gregory Palamas. You can get that book from SNUY Press, SUNY Press, 
for twenty dollars. Don't buy the three hundred dollar thing on Amazon. Go buy the twenty dollar one from SNUI Press. Or you could read uh, a book like this that would give you a good introduction to the theology of St. Gregory Palamas from a no noted Greek theologian. Um, another introductory book would be Michael Welton's book, Two Paths, uh, Papal Monarchy, Collegial Tradition by Michael Welton. Just, just a kind of, if you're starting out, kind of trying to suss out this issue. And then if you want to get into the more advanced uh, 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 books, I would recommend The Papacy by Abbe Gatte who uh, was a famous convert to uh, orthodoxy. And I would recommend uh, Edward Denny's book, Papalism, uh, which is another, this is a giant um, mega treatise, uh, 750 pages. So those are the hardcore treatises if you want to go down that route. But uh, thank you for watching this video. Let me know your comments and thoughts below. Hopefully we've demonstrated uh, the key issues. Again, if you have a, a dispute with one of the key issues that I've listed, remember we have like 900 videos covering these topics and more. And I have hundreds of essays and, and, and articles that I've written over the last uh, 10, 12, 15 years. So if you have a, some specific, there's probably an essay or, or piece or video that I've done that specifically outlines the topic that you have your qualms with. So uh, ask me in the comments and I'll send you that if you're actually genuinely interested. But thank you and uh, be sure and share this video if you enjoy it and subscribe below.